All right, we're gonna get started. I do wanna respect everyone's time. I know it's the evening, long day. I'm sure everyone has had, so good evening. Thank you all for coming out. I am City Council President Mary Sheffield, and this is our monthly uh, conversation series that we host every single month, where we host conversations throughout the city of Detroit on important topics that are important to you all. And so today, we are focusing on the Detroit Land Bank. Uh, we always get calls, uh, good and, you know, concerns, both, both good. Uh, and some also just with concerns or questions or pending uh, situations. So we thought it was important to bring all of the uh, individuals from the land bank here, have an update and allow you all to engage directly with the leadership of the Detroit Land Bank. So that is why we are here today. I uh, want you all to know, uh, again, that we do monthly newsletters as well, too. If you're not connected to our office, please make sure that you did sign in so that you can get updates from us on a monthly basis on what's going on in our district, current, current events, uh, and even things that are happening at the city council table. So please make sure that you guys are connected. Uh, I do want to introduce, uh, we have two new, uh, dep we have a new deputy district manager in a district manager for District 5. And so I want him to come up and introduce himself. Let's give him a round of applause. My partner. And so I just want him to introduce himself and then also explain what he does. Because some people get confused. Do I call my council person? Do I call my district manager? You can call both of us, but I want you all to understand what his role is and how he can assist you. Good evening, everyone. How are you today? Good. My name is Joshua Robertson. I'm your new District 5 manager for the Department of Neighborhoods out of the mayor's office. And uh, walking through the door right now is my deputy district manager, uh, Mr. Keith Butler. And we are just excited. Um, this is about my fifth week, uh, my fifth week right now. And Mr. Butler uh, just started this week, but we're just getting our feet wet. Feels like we've been on a world tour, Council President. <laughs> Uh, going to different block club meetings and neighborhood associations. A part of what we do um, is that we are in charge of anything that has to do with blight, anything that has to do with um, illegal dumping in your neighborhood. If any of those issues are occurring near you, around you, please call our office, please call our cell phones and report it to us. Uh, we are also in charge of lot endorsements. So if you are looking to purchase a lot in your area, in your neighborhood, again, please uh, send um, your email or send your application to the land bank, as well as we're the ones that endorse it, as well as your block clubs and neighborhood associations. They're also in charge of endorsing it. Um, anything, any concerns that you have trying to get in touch with any of our individual departments, please, if you're getting the run around or you're feeling like you're being left out, just let us know so that we can contact that director directly and get some things moving for you, all right? Uh, Mr. Butler. Deputy, yep. Hello, hello, hey, how are you? Hello, hello, Keith Butler. I'm the new deputy manager. Uh, I'm excited to be in District 5. Spent a lot of time in District 5. Graduated from the Martin Luther King High School. Uh, spent a lot of a lot of years right here at 1121 Seaburn Street, uh, so I, I have a, a a lot of interest in uh, District Five, but specifically this this area, this particular neighborhood. Um, my partner Josh here said all of the things that we do, um, but other than that, we're ready to, to get down in the trenches with you guys, get our hands dirty, um, and do whatever it is that we can to make District Five uh, the best district in the city of Detroit. Uh, so, I'm glad to be here. Thank you, guys. If you need anything, let us know. Thank you. All right. So, we are fully loaded, District 5. We got two young men here representing the administration. And then on our side from uh, District 5, my office, I do want to recognize uh, Raymond Simpson, if you could raise your hand, who's my community relations. Alfonso Horton, raise your hand. And then our newly hired uh, Tyler Searcy, who will be uh, the manager of community relations as well. So that's our community side as well. Make sure you get to know them if you guys have any, rela any uh, questions or issues regarding community relations and just constituent issues, they should go through that, those particular individuals, all right? So with that being said, we are going to get started. Uh, we have the executive director of the Land Bank here with us, Ms. Tammy Daniels, and I have to say I have personally been pleased 
with Ms. Daniels. I know there's a lot of issues with the land bank, but I really believe that she is serious about trying to improve customer service, customer relations, transparency with the land bank. So we appreciate your time. Thank you for being here, and the floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be here with you guys tonight. I um, was so excited when President Sheffield um, asked us to come and address her constituents, and I felt it was important for just for me not to come, but to bring a team of people here who are armed or experts in their respective fields that can talk about all of the issues that um, we that we expect you to hear tonight. We've got compliance, we got sales and programs, we have vacant land policies, and we have uh, community partners. And in the back, we also have customer service. We have a new team of our customer service team who answer your calls and inquiries on the phone. So every, we, we believe we have our bases covered. And so I'm gonna turn it over to London. We have a short presentation to walk you through, and then we'll take any and all questions, and we'll stay as long as you need us to stay. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. Um, before we kick things off, I'm going to pass the mic to Dwayne uh, just to introduce the team. Good evening, everybody. I want to thank you for having us. Uh, my name is Dwayne Barnes. I'm the city council and government liaison from the land bank. Um, and so I you know, have a lot of contact with the president's office and her uh, staff and helping getting some of the issues resolved. Um, I want to let you know tonight we're going to you know, provide a quick presentation. Um, we're going to have question and answer, and then we'll, ask, we'll also have uh, live constituent relations. So if you have questions about specific things, we'll need to get something ironed out. We'll definitely have um, staff ready to do that. But before we get into all the good stuff, I want to definitely uh, pass the mic so everyone can introduce themselves. And I'll start here at the end, and we can come back around uh, this way. Go. Good evening, everybody, and thank you for taking time out of your schedule to come and participate in your neighborhood. Uh, that's what makes the dream work. My name is Raphael Cole. I'm with the compliance team at the Land Bank, and we work with people who have bought a property and are trying to bring it back to productive use. You are the engine in Detroit. Good evening, District 5. My name is Rosalind Harper. I am the manager of the sales and programs team at the Detroit Land Bank. We manage auction properties, own and now properties, side lot, neighborhood lots, and the Create a Project program. I am here to help. I'm always available. I'll give out my direct email and phone number. And again, we're here to serve the citizens of Detroit. Welcome. Good evening again. Uh, my name is London Scott. I'm the Community Initiatives Program Manager. Uh, my, my primary responsibility is working with outreach, uh, connecting with different organizations, and assuring that we have staff available to come out and assist you all on presentations and hosting community events. Good evening, everyone. I am Nicole Scott. I am a project manager on the real estate team, formerly the dispositions team. I manage the marketed properties that are marketed through real estate brokers. All right. OK, um, so tonight's presentation, we're going to focus on land reuse. Um, part of the reason why we're here tonight is um, there has been an interest expressed to the DLBA on how to purchase land. And so we're going to go through a presentation tonight that walks you through how to purchase land from our flagship programs. Uh, not only our flagship programs, but if you're a developer or you're a community partner, we want to give you all a range of options so you know, so you know exactly um, the protocol and the steps in order to make this dream come true. Um, so. The first thing we always like to do with our presentations is start with a highlight of our landing page. And so this is our home web page. You can access this at buildingdetroit.org. Um, our website has seen a recent update where we have done um, revamping so that our options and tools and programs are more accessible for our residents. And so as you can see, there are three icons in the center page. One will assist you with purchasing properties. Another will assist with buying vacant land, and another will assist, uh, which is the highlight, actually, of our new website where we have an all listings map. And this all listings map, sorry. 
this all listings map puts the inventory of the DLBA in your hands with the click of your fingertips. And so with this map, it's kind of blurry on the presentation with the slider, um, but on the map, um, you're, you're able to search properties that are within the DLBA's inventory. So there is a tool on the side, a ledger, when you could click through and select for homes, also uh, vacant land as well. Now, if you're looking for property to purchase from the DLBA, um, often we have situations where our residents and constituents are looking for land that is not listed in any of these programs. So if you can see at the bottom, there's one checklist that is unchecked, it's called unlisted properties. And so if you click this option, vacant land and vacant structures will appear on this map. And so this is a very helpful tool uh, for you to identify properties that are in ownership of the DLBA. Um, once you go to the search bar, which is in the top right hand corner, you can actually put a district, a street name, a street intersection, uh, property, uh, specific property address, and that those details will come up for that property. Not only will those, de those details appear, but also you can click and see how to purchase that property as well. And so we also have a, a other few tools that are available such as Google Maps and Detroit Parcel Viewer. Now, if you're not familiar with this tool, please write this down, Detroit City Parcel Viewer. Now, this is a helpful tool in identifying which, pro which properties and parcels of land are actually under ownership of the DLBA. Uh, we have many times where residents reach out to inquire on properties that may not, in fact, be under DLBA ownership. This tool right here, um, is really, is, is not quite popular within the city, uh, I find it to be. Um, but once you have access to this, uh, to this platform, there's a plethora of data that you can find. So once you look up a property on this uh, website, you can see who the owner is, uh, what the last taxes are that were assessed on the property, what the property is owned, and uh, other relevant information as well. Also a map that shows where this property is located within the city. And then also, we're all familiar with Google Maps, but this is a helpful tool as well. Now to hop into the bread and butter of today's presentation, here are some of the flagship programs that we have that we offer at the DLBA if you are a resident looking to purchase vacant land. And so I'm just gonna quickly touch on accessory structure lots and oversized lots. Um, because these won't be quite the focus of today's presentation. So accessory structure lots are street adjacent lots to occupy owner properties. These lots are sold at the price of $250. And these lots contain structures, uh, structures that are not greater than 70, 750 square feet. And so we're talking small structures such as garages, carports, gazebos, uh, sheds. And so these lots are sold at the price of $250, but they must be street adjacent meaning on the same side of the street as the property that you currently own and reside in. Also, we have oversized lots. Now, oversized lots is another program that sells street adjacent lots to the occupied property, meaning the property that you live in and reside. Now, these lots are greater than 7,500 square feet, but do not exceed 15,000 square feet. They're sold at the price of $200, and only one purchase can be made from this program. And that's not per year, that's on a program basis. And that's pretty much because of the size of the lot. Now these lots, if you think about it, 7,500 square feet to 15,000 square feet, may be the size of three typical side lots. And so we're gonna jump in and talk about side lots, which is one of our flagship programs. So the side lots program is a program where you can purchase lots that are directly adjacent to your property. Now, by directly adjacent, we mean touching the property lines of your property. Now, as you can see in the diagram right here, there's color coded for the homeowner, which is in gray, and you see there are five lots that are green. So you can purchase up to five lots at a time with the neighborhood lots program. Now, keep in mind, these lots are sold at the price of $100. There is no compliance period once you purchase from this program. So once you purchase a lot from this program, the lot is, is yours. Once you receive the title, you're clear to do what you desire to do on the land. Keep in mind if uh, your intentions and your desires to build on the land 
are, out, are outside of the current zoning, then you will need to consult with BC, which is Building Safety, Engineering, and Environmental Department. Um, now, as you can see, there are yellow lots as well. So as we just said earlier, you can purchase up to nine lots from the DLBA within a calendar year. Um, actually, you can purchase up to nine properties, including structures as well. So if you are to purchase the first five lots, after you purchase the first five lots, you can purchase the other four lots that are directly adjacent to those lots. And adjacent by adjacent, again, we mean touching the physical property lines of that property. And also as an update to this program, we are now allowing purchases by vendings and land contracts. So if you're in a land contract and you're paying to own your property, you can purchase a neighborhood lot. So here are some of the requirements and the process in order to purchase neighborhood lots. Um, first, once the application is received, there is a 10-day holding period. Uh, from the date of the first uh, application that is submitted, this is when the holding period goes into effect. Then we review the application uh, to verify adjacency, to make sure that you are uh, adjacent to this property that you are applying to purchase. We look at the time that is submitted from the first applicant. So in the case there are two applications or more than one application submitted, uh, we do check for adjacency and time of the submitted applications. Uh, next, we have eligibility. So we do check to make sure that you own that property that you have listed that is adjacent to these side lots. You must be a homeowner and own these properties again um, or be in a, a land contract to purchase this property. We also verify taxes. We make sure that you are compliant with any other DLBA properties that you have purchased in the past. We make sure you don't have any standing blight tickets. And also, we make sure there are no current uh, tax delinquencies on your properties. Uh, next, we collect a payment. This can be done by credit or debit card. Also, cashier's uh, check or money order. Um, and then from there, you go to closing. Uh, after this, the deed is processed, and the recorded deed will be sent via mail via email within 30 days. Next, we have the Neighborhood Lots Program. Um, now, one of the issues we saw with side lots was that some of these lots were going unattended, and the adjacent neighbor had no interest in purchasing this lot. And so earlier last year, we came out with this program called Neighborhood Lots, that would allow residents within 500 feet to purchase these same lots, which were initially side lots. Um, so with the side lots program, these lots are listed for 180 days. After 180 days, these lots graduate to the neighborhood lots program, which gives other residents within the area an opportunity to purchase these same lots. Now 500 feet, we're talking typically a block to a half block away. Um, now with the neighborhood lots program, there are two things that happen simultaneously once these lots graduate from the side lots program. The first thing is that adjacency is increased. So as we said with side lots, you have to be directly adjacent to the property in order to purchase, whereas with neighborhood lots, you can be within 500 feet. This also includes lots across the street. With neighborhood lots, you cannot purchase a neighborhood lot across the street because it is not directly adjacent to your property lines. Now with side lots, you can purchase lots across the street. Um, also, another thing that occurs simultaneously once these lots graduate from the side lots program to the neighborhood lots program is that the price increases from $100 to $250. Um, and also, uh, to wrap things up on this program, um, as our newly appointed district manager said, uh, there is a neighborhood lot endorser program. So in order to purchase from the neighborhood lots program, you must have an endorsement from a registered neighborhood lot endorser. Now, there are options, there are ways that you all can participate to do this as well. We'll go over that in just a second. But if there are no registered neighborhood lot endorsers within your area, your district manager or your district deputy manager can act as that neighborhood lot endorser and endorse this purchase for you. So before we jump ahead, um, I know you all may be thinking, um, well, how do I get this endorsement? Who do I reach out to? Um, our process at the DLBA is there's an automated email, automated email that is sent out to the registered neighborhood lot endorsers, including your district managers, um, in order to endorse this application. Now, they don't have the opportunity to deny your application. They only have the opportunity to endorse. But there is a period, I believe, which is two months, where if you do not receive an endorsement within two months, you do have to start from square one. 
So just for clarification, Psy Lots is the program where you can purchase lots that are directly adjacent to your property. This does not include lots across the street. These are available for $100. Neighborhood Lots is the program that Psy Lots graduate from where you can make purchases for $250, including lots across the street. Um, and with the Neighborhood Lots program, you do need um, an endorsement from a district manager or a registered endorser. Um, also, with Neighborhood Lots, there is, um, there is criteria where you would need a principal residence exemption, which is a PRE, that shows you are the owner of that property. Now, if you don't have a PRE for that property where you reside, there is substitution. Um, you can submit a copy of your ID that matches the address associated with the deed, and you will have to receive. You will have to submit a copy of the deed as well. This is how you get around the PRE criteria. Um, now, jumping back to the neighborhood lot endorser criteria. Just hold it up. Okay. So for for neighborhood lots. Uh, quickly, I just want to go over the requirements for the program. Again, you have to have ownership. You have to have a principal residence exemption um, unless you have that substitution with the deed and your ID that matches um, taxes and compliance as well and adjacency. This is similar to side lots. This is something that we verify. So often as well for the district managers that are here, um, sometimes we get calls from our neighborhood lot endorsers and they're like, hey, you know, I'm not sure if this person lives right here next to this lot or I haven't seen them within the community, I don't know if I should endorse this. Well, we do a background check to verify everything uh, after the lot is endorsed to verify that this person does indeed live within 500 feet. They are up to date on their taxes. Um, they do have a PRE, all of the requirements that you see in front of you. Who else are endorsers? Um, so with the program, I'm, I'm gonna go over that in just a sec. So here's the process again, which is very similar to side lots. After the first application is received uh, and an endorsement is uh, placed on that application, then the 10-day holding period starts. Within this 10-day holding period, we still allow other applicants to apply for this property as well. In case we receive more than one application, we do verify uh, who's closer to the property and who submitted an application first. Um, we also verify, again, ownership, PRE, taxes, compliance. Um, endorsement and adjacency as well. Um, then next we collect payment and then the recorded deed will be emailed to you within 30 days. But unlike Silots, there is a three-day uh, reconveyance period, compliance period for neighborhood lots. So with Silots, if you purchase from the program, once you receive the deed, you, you're, the DLBA is out of your hair in layman's terms. But with neighborhood lots, there is a three-year compliance period. So within this three years, you just want to keep the lot up. You want to mow the lot, um, shovel the snow, um, assure that there is no debris on the lot. You don't want to receive blight tickets. I mean, nobody, everyone here wants to be a good neighbor to the next neighbor, and we want to improve the aesthetics of our neighborhood. So you just want to keep up your lot and make sure it's maintained. Don't receive blight tickets, and you'll be fine. And so... Um, to our city council, Mary Sheffield's uh, question for neighborhood lots. Uh, so endorsers, there are two options that you can follow to be a neighborhood lot endorser. Now those paths are, the first one is if you're a block club or a community organization, you can register your organization with the city by getting in contact with your district manager. Uh, once your organization is registered, uh, they will send that information over to us and we will give you an application it only takes about two minutes to fill out. We have a video online that walks you through it as well. Um, and then, uh, if you are a nonprofit organization, you can sign up with the Detroit Land Bank Authority to become a community partner. Now, this route uh, does uh, allow you to receive further discounts as well. Uh, our community partners are eligible for 20% off uh, on purchases from the DLBA, whether it's structures or vacant land. Um, so if you are indeed a nonprofit organization and you have a 501c3 file with the state of Michigan um, and everything's verified, you have an articles of, of, and articles of uh, incorporation for your organization, um, you can register to be a community partner with the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Um, and then also, again, your local district or deputy manager can act as a registered neighborhood lot endorser if there are none registered within the area or if the registered neighborhood lot endorsers are get, aren't getting back to you 
and you have a good relationship with your district manager, that's always helpful as well. And so currently we do have 104 neighborhood lot endorsers registered with the DLBA, and collectively these endorsers have endorsed over 600 lots. So we do encourage you all to take advantage of this opportunity and sign up. If you're a part of a neighborhood uh, organization, including block clubs, um, please do reach out to your district manager. Um, so another program we have is the Creator Project program, which we refer to as CAP. Um, now with the Neighborhood Lots program, uh, one of the uh, issues that we saw was that block clubs and neighborhood organizations were acting as endorsers and endorsing pr uh, purchases, but they couldn't apply to purchase the land themselves. Because with side lots, you have to have a principal residence exemption. And if you are an organization, you can't, be, uh, you can't have a PRE because a PRE shows that you have sole ownership of that property. Where we know that uh, uh, organizations such as community organizations have many members, so there's no way you can have a PRE on that property. So we developed a program called Create a Project. Now with this program, community partners, uh, neighborhood organizations can purchase these same lots from the, side, from the neighborhood lots pool. And again, those are the lots that are sold at the price of $250. Now again, who can apply um, to purchase from the CAP program? Block clubs and community groups, LLCs, and also nonprofit organizations that have 501c3 filed with the state of Michigan. To simply put, you must be registered with Laura uh, with the state of Michigan. Now, what type of projects can you do uh, with these uh, neighborhood lots? You can do play spaces, uh, community gardens, or any other community-focused projects. Um, and this is how you apply. So if you go to our website, at the top, there is an option for purchase property. If you scroll down, um, you'll see all of the programs that we talked about, but you'll also see Create a Project. And here's the link as well if you want to go directly to the page. Uh, buildingdetroit.org forward slash create a project. And again, uh, neighborhood lots are the lots that are sold through the Create a Project program. These are lots, again, that are not greater than 7,500 square feet. Um, and they must be located within that organization's area. So whatever area, whatever area your organization services, uh, this is where you can apply to purchase lots. Okay, um, so here are some other options for you all to purchase uh, lots as well. So if you are a developer um, or you're deeply, heavily uh, within real estate and you're looking to purchase properties that do not fit in any of those flagship programs, you can also purchase from our marketed uh, properties. Um, Nicole here is from our, um, our real estate team and she's gonna go over the details with you all uh, after the presentation. If you have any questions, she'll definitely assist. Um, so with the Marketed properties, uh, two, high, two programs that we want to highlight first are new build opportunities, and then we also have homestead sites. And again, these are programs where you will work directly with our real estate team, and a project manager such as Nicole herself will help you all to complete with these properties, complete purchasing these properties. So with our marketed properties, um, the purpose of this program is to sell vacant lots for the development of new housing and also multifamily housing as well. Um, we're targeted at selling one to nine lots to create opportunities for developers, including small scale developers as well. Um, with this program, when you're working with the project manager in order to complete the sale, you will have to fill out an application that is reviewed by uh, City Planning Commission and the DLBA as well. Along with your uh, application, you will have to submit design documents and also um, proof of uh, funding to show that this is a feasible project that you can handle. Um, now another uh, program is through our marketed properties pipeline is the homestead sites. Um, now this is a program where the DLBA sells houses that are bundled with adjacent lots. So it's kind of a combination of lots and structures as well. Um, this is used to activate vacant lots for agriculture, gardening, gathering spaces, and beautification as well. Um, and these are targeted for uh, zoned areas R5 and R6, which are traditionally low density, high vacancy areas uh, throughout the city. Um, if a purchaser defaults on the terms of compliance uh, within this process, the DLBA does have the right to take back the lots uh, that are within this sale. And again, these properties are sold at market value. Uh, now with the reconveyance, um, as we stated with side lots, we're actually neighborhood lots. 
um, and some of our other programs as well. Um, with these programs, there are clauses in place uh, where the DLBA can reconvey these lots. Um, so again, we want to stay uh, in good standing with compliance. Uh, we have Rafael with us um, who will answer any questions that you all have uh, with compliance, which is which takes place after closing. So after you close on a property, um, there is a period where you must be compliant with the DLBA. Uh, some periods range from three years, and some, some periods range uh, just until you complete uh, certain aspects of developing that property. All right, um, another reason why we're here tonight is to identify uh, ways that you all can get in contact with us for inquiries. And so if you all have any inquiries, uh, whether they are purchase inquiries or uh, inquiries of anything you would like to see taken care of within your neighborhood uh, concerning DLBA properties, you can email us at inquire at DetroitLandBank.org. Um, here are a few certain scenarios that we've placed before you. Uh, but simply put, if you all have any general questions and you don't know which department to reach out to, you can contact us by emailing us at inquire at DetroitLandBank.org. Here's a list of our current maintenance priorities. Uh, number one would be inspections on homes to identify sale candidates for the auction program, which is our flagship program for selling uh, single family homes. Um, also responding to maintenance inquiries, uh, which pose an immediate health or threat uh, to safety within the neighborhood. And then we also have completion of pre-sale maintenance on auction homes. Um, now we want you all to keep in mind that the DLBA does uh, within our inventory, we have over 62,000 62, lots. Um, to, be, to be precise, it's 62,781 lots. Um, and so the cost of maintaining these, these lots uh, is very expensive. And so we do get a lot of inquiries from you all. We do have a mowing schedule. Uh, we do remain a constant relationship with GSD to monitor and maintain these properties as well. So here are some of the priority listings for uh, maintenance inquiries. So we have tree maintenance, illegal dumping, debris removal, lawn care, um, boarding and securing, and suspected, suspected illegal activity at any DLBA properties. Now with these, um, if you witness any of these within your neighborhood, the best way to contact us again is inquire at DetroitLandBank.org, emailing us there. Please do include pictures. Now if, um, if the nature of the uh, issue is illegal dumping or suspected illegal activity, please do reach out to DPD. Please don't put yourself in harm's way by stepping out and trying to take pictures of this. This is not something that uh, we want to um, advocate for. Um, but please do contact us and let us know, and we'll work with GSD, um, your uh, city council representatives, Department of Neighborhoods, and DPD to get this issue, situation handled. Again, um, we spoke on lawn care, so we do work with GSD. Um, during the season, there are five mows uh, during the time period uh, from, I believe, uh, April to the end of August, uh, we, where we work with GSD to go out and get these lawns mowed. Um, there is a schedule that is on GSD's website, uh, and GSD is General Service Department. They are a department within, within the city of Detroit. Um, these lots, the mowing schedule is separated according to the district. As you all know, there are seven districts within the city of Detroit. And again, we do have over 60, 62,000 lots. Um, so um, this is the best plan that we have to uh, take care of the maintenance of these lots associated with the city. Here are some helpful links that will help you all. Again, just as a recap uh, and closing out, for Create a Project, um, here are some links. Also, the DLBA All Listings Map, which helps you all to identify which properties are under ownership of the DLBA. And then we also have the Neighborhood Beautification Grant Program, uh, which is a program that is maintained by the city that is run in uh, adjacency with our program for CAP. Um, so one thing I didn't mention earlier with the CAP program, uh, once you secure a lot from the DLBA, you can also apply for grant funding from the city uh, via the Neighborhood Beautification Program. Uh, this will allow you to do any renovations you want to do within that property to build your playscape or community meeting uh, space. And then also, um, if you have questions about the Creator Project Program, here's an, an email. It's inventorycap at DetroitLandBank.org. And then also, uh, if you have any questions about um, any of the land reuse programs that we mentioned here, 
Uh, you can get in contact with our land reuse team at landreuse at DetroitLandBank.org. Um, also, I want to highlight one of the strategies that we have partnered with the city of Detroit to complete uh, that addresses anti-dumping. Um, so this is a board uh, composed of DLBA representatives, GSD, uh, BC, uh, Department of Neighborhoods, where we've come together collectively uh, to create a website, a landing page that will help you all and assist you all to report illegal dumping, um, schedule a pickup paid service, uh, identify our locations to drop off um, dumpings and uh, anything that you may want to get rid of from your property uh, that may not be collected from bulk. Um, and also a Motor City Makeover. If you are not hip to Motor City Makeover, it's a great opportunity to connect with your neighborhood, to work with different individuals, with or other organizations to clean up the neighborhood as well. Um, and here's our contact information. Um, if you are uh, social media savvy, you can fo follow us at buildingdetroit.org. Um, building, building Detroit, I'm sorry, Building DET on Instagram. Uh, building Detroit on Facebook and Building DET on Twitter. And also, um, if you need to get in contact with us, you can reach us at inquire at DetroitLandBank.org or you can give us a call at 313-974-6869. Now, before I close, um, we do have representatives and staff available from our customer service team. Um, I know in the past uh, we have received many complaints that Oh, when I call the land bank, I'm on hold for an hour, 45 minutes, two hours. So we don't do that anymore. Um, our, our client service team has been revamped. They are now officially customer service. Um, they are under new leadership, and our average hold times are from 6 to 15 minutes. And so you all can call and get right through to directly to who you need to speak to. And um, we are all focusing, um, as our city council president said earlier, on being transparent and putting out correct and accurate information. Um, sorry to take up so much time. What's that? What's that? Oh, yeah. So, so this, this, this entire slideshow we've sent over um, to staff here. Um, they're more than welcome to share with you all. We have PDF format and we have PowerPoint format. So. Testing one, two. We'll make sure everyone here today gets a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. No problem. Are you all done presenting? Okay, so now we can go straight to questions and answers. Okay, so if anyone has a question, just raise your hand, and then one at a time, come to the microphone, and you can ask your question. And yes. I've got several questions. Uh, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to go with the, the side lot situation because it's kind of dual. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the block of Sheridan and Palmer, and I met compliance on my land bank home. It's my primary residence. I've been in there over a year. There is a commercial, old commercial gas station next to my house. Uh, the way that it was built is kind of like right in my house. So uh, the, the property been dilapidated for years. What I did upon myself is clean the area because it, it looked so bad next to my house. Everybody said, oh, yo, you did such a good job with your house, this, that. But what you gonna do with that? You know, it's debris up under the ironing of it. Um, and so I would like to purchase the land after it's demolished and cleaned up. Um, I keeps the grass cut. I think, Mr. Barnes, I talked to you before yep. about yep. that. Yep. Um, so um, I'm just hoping something can be done about it. Uh, it's, 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 they, they did come out. And I caught the guys, and they was willing to board it up. They called in. They said, go ahead, board. They boarded it up. You know, but it's still an eyesore for uh, it's an eyesore. Uh, rats, cats, you know, uh, homeless people, whatever. Um, so definitely would like to get something done about it. Uh, just talked to a gentleman today. They was out there. Uh, it was a company called Manic that was out there prior to the summer where they, they drilled, I guess, testing the soil. So I tried to find out 
what was the results of that? Was it soil contaminated, so forth? I know the soil got to have some type of contamination because it was, it's, you know, they had gas tanks down there, oil, and as I cut, still cut that grass, I still pull up all type of oily rags and so forth and so on. So it was another company, I believe it's USC, that was out there today, and he said that they finna do some more samples. And so I was wondering if the land bank has that information, you know, am I living next to contaminated mm -hmm. soil? Do I gotta worry about breathing any pollution that may be evaporating out the land? Uh, is my drinking water bad? You know, what, what, could, what could we do about that? So um, I can't answer anything about environmental issues, but I work on the real estate team, and um, if there's a structure on it right now and there's plans to demolish it and it's not offered as a side lot or a neighborhood lot, I would suggest, and I don't know if you've already done this, to put an inquiry in or even an application. Have you submitted an application I, I to have. purchase it? No, I just, they no, was just told, I was told that I could do the inquiry. I did that about eight months ago. Okay, well, I will also suggest, um, you know, just putting an application um, in on it. So it's the creative project that they, um, that London mentioned. Mm -hmm. So you could submit your application and then that way our team, because if it doesn't, like I said, go to the side lot or neighborhood lot program, then you'll have that application there and then we can also notify you, you know, because you've already shown interest in it. Right. Yeah. Um, but also with that, um, let me see, they, uh, I talked to somebody at the land bank and, and they said that it's on the demo list, mm -hmm. however, it, it'd take about another year mm -hmm. for it to get torn down, but we had two Detroit land bank homes in that neighborhood, one in, in the next block from me, caught on fire, within two weeks that house was torn down. Okay, I understand that it's unsafe. Yeah. This, this, unsafe. You know, so I don't understand why the priority of a burned down house gets torn down before this, and it's been like this partition is, is falling over, and it just, it all, all it takes is just a tree to, to ride out enough, and it's gonna fall. So, um, so yeah, again, I can't really answer that question. Um, and also, we don't demo. Um, the, the city of Detroit does the demolitions, but um, our inventory um, does, you know, get inquiries about, you know, like you said, the, the fire and whatnot. And that probably was more of a hazard, at least, you know, compared to the, because the, the structure is still there. It's just dilapidated. But yeah, I can't really speak about why there's priority specifically. All right, thank you. I, I, I wanted to add, add to that too. Um, so we're setting up outside, uh, some of our staff is setting up. Um, so this sounds like a specific property related issue. So if you could step outside and provide us with your contact information. Okay, we who, can, uh, who do I see? Yeah, so Dwayne is, Dwayne is outside setting up, I believe with some of our staff. Okay. Um, but please leave you know, your contact information, the address. Um, and if you have the inquiry number, that would help. But if not, we can use your name and look it up. Um, and that way we can put you in contact with the best individual and we have time to look within our system to see exactly what can be done. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for this forum. Uh, I have uh, a few questions myself. Uh, number one, it seems as though there are a lot of moving parts to what's going on with the land bank and a huge staff. Who has oversight over the land bank? from the local level and state level? Oversight? So, okay, thank you so much. Now, why is, what is the rationale? Okay, what is the rationale for having to own a structure for a side lot? Let's just say I own a lot but I don't live on the lot because it's a vacant lot. But there are other vacant lots next to my vacant lot. If I wanted to purchase those so I could build something, why must I have a structure? What is the rationale for that uh, requirement? Um, so currently, we only have so many programs to address, as London said, 62,000 lots within the city of Detroit. Right now, the program that we have is a side lot program. And in order to buy 
the adjacent lots, there has to be an occupied structure. Just saying that someone would have onus and ownership of that lot and be somewhat guaranteed to maintain the other lots that are surrounding their home. The other um, policy that we have right now is the neighborhood lot. And again, that, lot, that program was implemented because other neighbors that lived across the street or down the street were taking care of the other lots that were not directly near their home and they wanted to buy them. Again, we're trying to make sure that the, the legacy residents and the neighbors that live in the neighborhood are able to buy lots within their neighborhood. But we're looking for an occupied structure to ensure that it's not someone that lives someplace out of Detroit or wherever that are buying the lots and not taking care of them. That's why the policy for a side lot is an occupied structure. And for a neighborhood lot, it's um, 250 as opposed to 100 if you're a side lot. So hopefully if you're putting more money in, you're still going to take care of that lot. We're looking to put the um, lots back into productive use, to put those lots back into city, into um, the monies for the lot, back into the taxes, so they can help with the upkeep of the lots within the city of Detroit. And again, it's for the residents. That's why we're looking for an occupied structure. So, so can I say something as well, uh, ma'am? Oh, I'm so, sorry. That's okay. Are the, do, do you know if those other two lots um, on the side of the lot that you own, are they neighborhood lots or side lots? I have no idea whether so, they're neighborhood. Go ahead. Okay, if, so if you're not sure and if they aren't, again, you can also create a project. Yeah. You can submit an application and um, and then you know make an offer and in that way if you if you want to purchase it you could do it that way so you don't necessarily have to build something on it but if you did um, you would have to since you're already an owner of the middle lot you would have to verify you know zoning with BC and um, and planning and whatnot but yeah I, w I would encourage you you know to either um, go out and you know leave your contact information to find out what um, how are those uh, two lots being marketed if they are, and when I say market, I mean if they're side lots or neighborhood lots. But yeah, you can um, put in a, um, an offer or create a project for that. Let me just interject myself into this. Um, with 62,000 lots, I would think that you would be eager to get rid of some of them so that you would not have to keep them up. Now, in interjecting myself, when you, when you say that, you really didn't give me a rationale for why a person can't own a lot and buy the adjacent lots next to what they own. I didn't understand the rationale. I didn't, I didn't feel that rationale. Okay. Let me finish. Now, I am a lifelong Detroiter, interjecting myself into this. I am 75 years old. If I live another two months, I'll be 76. I have raised all of my children, which I have three. My oldest is nearly 50. They are, I have one that's an engineer who really wants to develop, who really wants to come back to Detroit and develop in the community that he grew up in. So when you tell me that because um, the neighbors around them or some rationale about it has to be a structure and he can't come back and take pride in developing his own community, I have a problem with that, especially when we know people who do not even live in the country are buying lots and giving them. Now also, this young man said, and I'm challenging you because I'm old enough to do it. This young man said that um, you'd have to bring all your uh, plans and your details. My child did that, and he still couldn't get those lots. Now the lot that he owns, and some of the lots, it was a house on it. And then according to uh, BC, you have to have double lots to build. So he can't even build a single family home or a small home. It seems as though there's a lot of red tape for re uh, legacy Detroiters and de people who really take pride in their community and want to love Detroit. My child doesn't even want to come back to Detroit. He does not even want to come back to Detroit because he's in Texas where he, he's being treated better than he would if he were living in his own home city. So I have a problem. The rationale was not, did not make sense to me. Thank you so much, though, for answering my question, young lady.
Ma'am, do you mind if I just have a follow-up to the development part that you mentioned about your son and wanting to develop? So that's the program that I manage, the marketed properties where investors, um, uh, residents um, are able to uh, purchase property and invest in them, um, uh, develop on them. So w there is a criteria that um, developers, investors, residents have to meet, and it is on our uh, website. But I was just... Um, uh, uh, London um, didn't really go into detail about it, but it was something that I wanted to like, kind of just uh, let everyone know so that anyone who is interested in developing something that's marketed through our marketer properties, uh, you can, um, if you see the property or land uh, being marketed through a list, a broker, so you'll, you'll, you might see it like with Real Estate One or you might see it on one of those third party websites like Zillow, Realtor.com. Um, you, you, Okay, yeah, that's one of our brokers. Right, those are marketed properties that we sell through uh, the um, private market. But um, anyone can um, make offers on them. However, like I said, we do have criteria that you have to, um, to meet. So some of the things that we, and this is for all of the marketed properties on the real estate team, <clears throat> we look at the offer amounts, <clears throat> excuse me, as well as the feasibility of the project, experience and financing, and then neighborhood benefit. Unfortunately, we do get proposals where individuals are, don't show enough to support both the purchase and development. Development does cost, and in some instances when it's new development, um, it's, you know, it can, you know, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we do, um, you know, look at everyone's proposal and then again the scoring criteria is what how we score the um, applicants and then the highest uh, proposal wins so I, I just wanted I just wanted to speak to the aspect of the program uh, that requires you to be a homeowner um, so as you all as you all know within the DLBA we are huge advocates of home ownership and so as Nicole said uh, within the best interest of community of the community, we want to allow the first opportunity for homeowners to purchase these lots that are directly adjacent to your property. Because if this lot is right next to your home, you're going to put in your best effort to take care of it. Now that's another reason why we came out with the neighborhood lots program. Because in some instances, the adjacent homeowner had, didn't want anything to do with the lot. And so with the neighborhood lots program, we're allowing residents within 500 feet, which may be an entire block away, to purchase that same lot that's next to your home that you may not want to purchase. Um, and then also, you know, if you're not a homeowner within adjacency of 500 feet or directly adjacent to that lot, as Nicole said, there are other options to purchase, such as our real estate slash projects team. Now, the only difference is, you know, with neighborhood lots and side lots, the benefit of being a homeowner directly adjacent to that property is you can purchase that property for a relatively low price with the click of a button. You go to our website, you type in your address, all of the eligible lots that you can purchase will appear, and really within the click of a button, you can purchase that lot. Now, if you don't live directly adjacent to that lot and you still wanna purchase, there are options, there are just more stipulations required. So you have to go through our projects team and work with the project manager, and with this process, you do have to submit design documents, Again, you do have to show, as Nicole said, with development, this can be very costly. So you do have to show that you have funds that are to show that this process is feasible for you. And sometimes, in some situations, um, some of our applicants don't always meet the criteria to purchase these lots. Um, but we are working to, you know, to update things. Go ahead. Sure thing. I'm sorry, my last question to you is that a lot of land bank homes are uh, only sold in bundles, which means that an independent developer would not be able to buy five homes, but that independent developer could certainly afford and show you how they could afford to rehab one home at a time and really uh, beautify the city. So I'm trying to figure out why does the land bank continue to sell land bank homes in bundles where only large developers 
would have an opportunity to get those. So I would like for somebody to explain that one to me too. Thank you, I'm sorry. Can I take that one for you? Ma'am, the, <clears throat> the properties that end up in those bundles are properties that have typically either already been on the auction and haven't sold or they've gone, and so we can't find anybody to buy them. And so we bundle them together because they, um, they may have like large rehab costs and we need somebody we don't want to saddle an individual person with a house that we know is going to cost two, three hundred thousand dollars to rehab. So we need to vet the person purchasing them to show that they have the, you know, the experience and the financial wherewithal. So we try to make it more attractive because these houses are very, very expensive. So that is why they're bundled. But they've already, on an individual basis, been we've tried to sell them individually several and not times. been several times and not been successful. Okay, absolutely. To you other than putting everything on the website and everything up for auction, if you post something on those on us, I guarantee you we'll get anybody. Okay. We do, we do have, a, we do have a weekly auction uh, open. We have open houses. Um, so this, and this is for the entire room. So we have uh, open houses. It's an event where you can walk through a DLBA home and check out the house free of charge. Uh, we do recommend for you to bring a licensed builder or a design professional uh, to assist you in identifying areas to repair the homes. But we list, so these events take place Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and Sundays. And typically we list uh, 11 to 12 properties within a day. And sometimes these properties uh, appear in multiple districts. Um, and so anyone that wants, so typically we send out this list to our community partners so they can share it with individuals within their community. We also post these flyers on Facebook. Um, if you, anyone wants to get on that list to be notified of when we have open houses within your area so you can purchase auction homes and own it now homes, which are single homes, not bundled homes, please do you know, leave your contact information. You can leave it with me personally. I personally send out this email blast. And so if you want to receive that information, please leave your contact information. I'll glad you, gladly put you on that list. All right, thank you. Good evening. My name is Ms. Stevenson. Uh, I'd first like to just say that, unfortunately, I've experienced a lot of resistance with the Detroit Land Bank. And I'm, I can't speak for everybody in the room, but I'm thinking that most of the people in the room would agree that it just takes entirely too long to get something accomplished when you're dealing with the land bank. Literally, I've been waiting like maybe five years or more just to get a few answers about certain properties I've been interested in. Whereas even now, one of the properties that I've been interested in uh, has been set afire. It just took so long. I still haven't gotten answers about the property. While I've been waiting and, and waiting for um, answers through email or calling, somebody set the house on fire. So now I don't even know if the house is uh, it, habitable. And I work with a nonprofit organization where we offer transitional housing. We could have taken that property and you know rehabbed it and, and allowed it to be sheltered for people in need. Uh, that's just one concern. It's just the, the time factor and uh, sending emails where you don't get responses. You, you call, you're left on hold for hours. I know you did state that there's been some restructuring. So hopefully today will be the beginning of a new process where, you know, recipients and citizens of Detroit don't have to wait lengthy amounts of time to get things done. I mean, time waits for no one. And we're all trying to get some things accomplished. And, try to better our city. So I have another two quick questions. I wanted to ask, uh, how does the land bank determine the property line as it relates to side lots? I have an issue where one of our uh, nonprofit properties was, uh, the side lot was bought by the neighbor. I could say she's the neighbor from you know where, but anyway, that's another story. But what she's done is she cut down trees and did a lot of different landscaping changes and also fenced off the side lot, lot that she claimed she bought from the land bank and only left a very narrow era, area for our driveway. Like we're literally squeezing in the driveway because she fenced it off. So I'm wondering how does the land bank determine where the property line is and where that other neighbor that now owns the lot cannot cross? So, 
so we don't um so we so can we get the address that you're specifically talking about? Absolutely. Because typically, we sell a, a property by address. We do not give lot lines when we in our in our deeds to tell them this is this, your you know your your property goes over so far this way that way. So her putting up that fence sounds like that's she randomly picked that spot. That was not anything we told her. Mm -hmm. So we may it may be require a survey, somebody to come out and survey to tell you where the property property lines are. Right. Will the land make assist in that? Because she's very adamant that this is her property now. She bought the side lot and she took the liberty of fencing it off and everything. Like I said, we can barely get in our driveway because she fenced it off. So we will help you to identify who we should be talking to because we don't have surveyors on staff, but we can probably help you talk with the um, assessor's office to identify what the actual um, boundaries of the side lot are. Okay. 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 So, and then I think, think there are people outside. Yeah. I'm not, you can finish asking this next question, but I want you to go talk to them, give them the address so that we can, and your contact information so we can follow back up with you. Okay, on that great. Question. And then the last quick question is, does a land bank donate properties to nonprofits for any reason? Or is it just a discounted rate? It's severely discounted. We don't, we don't have a mechanism for donating. But they're not. So you could tell her about that program, but they're not donating. Yeah, she wants donated. Yeah, there, there is a program. It has recently, uh, the name has recently changed, but I used to be the project manager for that. Mm -hmm. So you can um, become um, a partner with the, it's the Occupy Nonprofit Program, and Elise Miller is the program manager. But as a nonprofit, so these properties are occupied. However, um, you can purchase the property um, at a very discounted price, very discounted, mm -hmm. and then. Um, the, the occupant, you can either work with the occupant um, and you know either rent or sell it to them, and then um, you'll own it. And then, but there is some um, rehab that has to be done to to the property. Um, it, it's it's not uh, a lot of rehab. You know, it has to be habitable. But um, that's that's another program where nonprofits can um, purchase properties outside of the CP program, the Community Partners program. Okay. But yeah, we don't donate properties. Okay. Could you repeat the lady's name, Elise? Uh, Elise Miller. She's the uh, Elise. program manager. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. All right, and just so you all know, for those who are here and you do not want to wait, um, we do have representatives from the land bank that are in the hallway who right. can assist you with specific issues regarding um, certain properties. So if you want to go out directly and just talk to them, uh, you can do that at this time. And then for those who are in line, if we could try to keep our comments around one or two questions within two minutes so that we can allow as many people as possible to speak. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Ward. Well, good evening. I was told by Council President Sheffield's policy person, uh, Paris Blessman, that if I came here tonight, I would get some answers. And uh, it's already seeming like that's not going to happen. Um, first of all, and I think it's not equitable to treat us differently after other people got to you know, engage. Um, so I got a couple of questions. Do you sign non-disclosure agreements? Is that why I showed up at land bank meetings for years asking for community engagement in my neighborhood? And it turns out that uh, there was some site acquisition going on. That's probably why folks are not being allowed your side lot because there are hold areas where they're not selling land. And that is, they are directed by the mayor through the economic development policy. Um, so. I want to know, because I went there for years, that was kind of a waste of my time asking for community engagement, and then it turns out that the land bank sold this land to a community partner who bought two houses from the land bank, didn't fix them up, lost them through a quiet title action. Uh, they had them well over for two years. And then this community development corporation hand selected a few people in the neighborhood, had them sign non-disclosure agreements, and then they planned a huge development, mostly on my block in secret, for three years and excluded the most impacted residents. I was told by some people in my neighborhood, including someone that I believe Mary Sheffield met with, that uh, 
people were passing around the narrative, white people were trying to stop a black developer as if the color of the person's skin had anything to do with our opposition. People do not appreciate the race baiting and the newbie versus old resident went on. We have 40 plus year residents who were denied side lots and you just said you want home ownership, but you're building a rent farm in my neighborhood. Um, so, um, do you sign non-disclosure agreements? Huh? No, no, we do not sign non So all that time I was there, no, you all, some people, John Ohana knew this was going on, but wouldn't tell me. That's a little disrespectful. I find that extremely disrespectful. Second of all, I'd like to know, um, first of all, everybody, that side lot policy, that's the newer side lot policy. My neighbor asked to buy property that she took care of for over a decade. She qualified under the side lot policy under Mayor Bing. She was told by your former community liaison person, Rod Liggins, that she would qualify because she took care of them. The land bank sent her a postcard saying she could buy these lots. She was allowed to, then she was denied the other ones. Watch what's about to happen. And then she was denied the other ones. She got four separate denials stating that somebody else applied first and they're sold on a first come, first serve basis. I did a FOIA Freedom of Information Act request. The person they sold these lots to had applied six days after my neighbor had applied. So then I asked your chief counsel, who's no longer there, well, I said, uh, your own stated reason for denial is not true. Watch, I'm about to get cut off, unlike the first gentleman, because I have been asking Mary Sheffield's office to help out with this bad side lot policy. Your former chief counsel presented this policy. That's the newer policy. That is not the policy that was in place when my neighborhood asked to buy those lots. So I would like to know, and you did attempt to explain one time on a Zoom meeting, but I didn't understand your reasoning, and they refused to put it in writing about why my neighbor was not sold those lots. I also would like to know, Council President Sheffield, why you and your staff person refused to meet with me about this, even though my neighbor uh, gave you permission to discuss it with me. All right. Thank you so much. Did you all have a response for the first question? So we've had this conversation a number of times, Ms. Warwick, and we've explained that to you. you no, you have no. You, you I'm talking Joanne, now. We have to I'm allow her to now. respond, please. So a number of times we've explained it to you. I, if if Ms. Mitchell is confused about what happened, I would absolutely entertain a conversation with her about her issue. I offer you the opportunity now to talk about issues that you have. Is there a side lot you like to buy, a neighborhood lot that you like to buy? It is an issue of mine, because you have caused my neighbor a lot of grief, and, and, and the, their secretive planning in my neighborhood has caused a whole bunch of neighbors grief. No, and now, the conversation right. we've had over and over again is that you refuse to explain it. Only at one point did John Ohana attempt to explain. I didn't understand. Right. I kept asking. Joanne, if you could just ask your last question, because a lot of people are Well, that's are it. Waiting. I'd like to know okay, the answer. Thank you. Why didn't you say that why did they, right. why did my neighbor not qualify under the side lot policy that was in place in 2019? And, okay, thank and you. President and I will answer your question. Thank you so much, Joanne. We can please uh, cut off that mic. So we st thank you, Joanne. If we, we're going to keep this in order and we're going to proceed to go on. I've answered the question numerous times as well. We have met with you, Joanne, and we truly appreciate you coming out this evening. Our next um, resident, please. Hello, everybody. My name is Felicia Tate, and I am with the Sheridan Community Block Club. We are relatively new. We just started this year, and so we tried to get in on the MVP grant. Uh, however, there, where we are, we are uh, East of Grand Boulevard, west of 94, north of, I'm sorry, north of Gratiot, Van Dyke, right where the Dakota plant is, okay? So we're right in that little area right there. And so sure enough, that area has become blighted. And we went through today, if I will leave you all with one of these sheets, to let you know that uh, we did put a grant in to get one of the side lots uh, to make it into a park for our community because we don't have one, however, we have children. Um, we were denied because it looks like the side lots have not become neighborhood lots. So my question to you is, because I know I got one of the cards for the adjoined property. Uh, how long does it take a side lot to become a neighborhood lot so that we can Six months. Uh, Six apply months. for this grant and make, make a park in our community? So a neighborhood lot, a, a side lot transitions to a neighborhood lot after six months. After six months. Right, so we, because, unless, oh, yeah. If it's, a, if it's a HHF lot, meaning that it was a, a house that we demolished, that could so take it, it has to be like R2 zone, R2 something like that, because it is R2 zone. So it is. Go ahead. 
So if it's a HHF lot, which means uh, that the house that sat on that lot was demolished using hardest hit funds, which were federal funds, we have to get a, a lien release from MISHTA. So all side lots do not transition and become neighborhood lots until those liens are released. So I can take the address down and, and find out where it is in that in the process. Okay. And be able to assist you with that. Okay. Because was we, there a house that was demolished on that property? In the well, actually, there is a whole block that we're trying to get. It's one, four, six, eight. It's about eight lots, and so and it's on the it's on the block of Townsend. Okay. And with that being said. We are a community block club, and we consist of four blocks. However, they sent us an email that said because we weren't adjacent to the property, which our radio patrol guy lives right across the street from that property, mm -hmm. and he, uh, we started the radio patrol and everything. He lives right across the street. He's been over there over 30-something years, and he said he would be responsible, you know, to... So here's what I would recommend. Go talk to the team out there and give them the addresses for the lots you're interested in, plus your contact information. Correct. And we can give you a, like a timeline on what's available, what will become available. Oh, right here. So Tamika back there can take okay. your information. One second. Okay, and then I have another one. Can I, can I say, can I, before you jump to the next one. Yes. So the program, I mean, the, the opportunity that would probably be best for you to mm. purchase all of those lots at once and make this, make this uh, project come true is the Creative Project Program, okay, which we so refer to as CAP. And so, right, and so, um, what's that? We tried that. Right, and so if you're, if you're a community partner, you get a discount on these lots as well. Okay. Um, but also, you don't have to be a nonprofit organization to apply mm. uh, through the CAP program. Okay. If you're a block club or a community organization, you can buy from this pool as well. Okay, because they had told us because we didn't live on that block, wasn't it something like that? This is uh, my, the uh, secretary, uh, that we couldn't get it because we didn't live on that block, but we're one block club. Yeah. So we will be able to yes. bypass that. If, we, if you can leave, like Tammy said, if you can leave us with your contact information, we'll definitely get you in touch with the, touch with the right individuals for sure. Okay, and in the MVP, because we couldn't get the lots, we end up saying that we wanted to work with Land Bank to get the land bank houses cleaned up. Well, they outsourced a company to come and clean some of the houses, but they left a lot of houses. In the blocks, they did maybe three here, four here, two here, one here. How do they decipher on what homes that they come and clean up in the neighborhood instead of doing like the whole, if you know you've got land bank houses that are blighted, and land bank is to prevent blight, correct? So if you know you got these blighted, how, how do they decipher on how they pick and choose the ones they clean and fix up? Because we have a lot of them. I brought pictures. I brought a poster board, but that was a bit much. Okay. <laughs> so and, and I thank them for the ones that they did clean up um, because they did. They have the company. They come out and they do clean up. However, they leave so many more. So how do they decipher on the ones they get and don't get? So I would say first we have to make sure we own them all because we don't necessarily own them all. Okay. But it sounds like our those properties might have gone through the proposal in stabilization. And so that is where we send them over to the city and they clean them out so that we can then save and salvage them. They, they may be so blighted that they cannot be saved and they're going to go into the demolition pipeline. Okay, because so we, we had a couple figure, of those yeah, as well. Yeah, so we have to figure out where, you know, if, they, if they're land bank on, what pipeline are they in, yes. and give you like a, a realistic timeline of when will you see this house come down as a demo, okay. when will this house mm -hmm. be up on the auction to be sold, if you guys are interested in buying a house, and, and for the lots, how we can get those lots to your neighborhood. Um, your block club so that you can do a, and you can reapply for the um, grant next year. Right? Okay, when it comes back. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that was really the uh, most of all of them. So Tamika is right back, back here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And she'll Give be able all to... your information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. If we can have these last three individuals ask your questions and then I do want to allow. Okay, and if you can, guys can just try to get straight to your questions, I do want to allow some time for residents to engage directly with the land bank. We have to be out of here around 8 p.m. So I want to allow us enough time to address specific issues as much as we can. So we can get straight to our questions. That would be great. Good evening. Good evening. If I put an application in for a side lot and I'm going through the trouble with your departments, trying to tell them who I am, fighting with them, submitting my deed and everything in, how long do you take the side lot when there's an interest in the side lot and turn it over to a neighborhood lot? So, so side lots, 
given there isn't an application submitted or in process for that side lot, after, as Tammy said, 60 days, six, six months, no, 180 I, days. I said my application was in. Okay. And I'm study fighting with your staff, telling them who I am. So, so you you want the lot to transition from a side lot no. to a neighborhood lot? No. I ha I put an application in for a side lot. First of all, I didn't get it. I'm supposed to get a postcard saying the, uh, is the lot is available. Never got a postcard. I automatically, anyway, put an application in. After I'm submitting all my paperwork in, your staff kept saying, uh, your deed is wrong, this is not you, and I'm study fighting with, the, with your department saying, this is me, what else do you need, ID, I'm submitting everything you've asked me to do. This takes a year. How soon do you submit the side lot to a neighborhood lot? Because you took it from right up onto me and made it a neighborhood lot. It's six months. Yeah. So it no, transitions. It, okay, we took more than six months because I was fighting for this lot since 2019. So the, the then, so the neighborhood lot program is newly released. It just came out, I believe, uh, November 2020. 2020. It's November 2020 is when the neighborhood lot program came about. And the first graduation from side lots to neighborhood lots was in a period of June to July. So we gave an extra, an additional two months for that first graduation period. But if you, if you are looking to purchase that lot that was a side lot and it's now a neighborhood lot, you can still purchase it no, as a neighborhood no. lot. You took it from up under me and a neighbor down the street brought it because I didn't know it went to a neighborhood lot. How would I know that if I'm still inquiring, saying what's going on, what's the status, I'm coming down there, you even asked me to submit a DT bill, which I thought, why are you asking me to submit a DT bill? I never heard nobody say they had to submit a DT bill. And while I'm coming down there, your phones that, that one month were off. Everybody was getting drop calls of being on hold for hours when they called down there. Can you, can you leave us your contact information and Rosalind and I will personally well, will follow up with you? I, I know, y'all gonna follow up with me. I, okay, like everything else, y'all gonna follow tomorrow, up with me? I, I, I'll I'll will, tomorrow, I will get in contact okay, with well, you tomorrow. I'll call you tomorrow. Well, let me, let me tell Ms. Tammy, I had a personal meeting with you okay. in June. Mm -hmm. I still don't have my side lots from other properties. I still what don't have my side lot. Pat Whaley. Pat Whaley. Oh, y'all know me. And they put yes. the DTE. They asked for DTE. They know me. I still don't. And that had a personal yeah. meeting with you. I still don't have my side lots. So I guess you're going to transfer them to neighborhood lots and let somebody down the block get those from me, too. If you, if you leave your contact information, mm -hmm. both Ross, we'll, we'll be sure to follow up with you tomorrow. I'll, I'll, see, for you, sure. I'll see if we get done. Okay, How you doing today? Good. How you doing? I'm okay. My name is Dwayne Daniels. I stay at 2996 Bewick, and the side lot next to me was sold in the same situation as her. It was demoed by the city. Okay, then they claimed that I couldn't do nothing until the lot was cleared. Now, if you come by my residence, which I invite you, the lot has never been cleared. It's still a stump. It's still a tree. It's still a back fence and they're not upkeeping the growth on the side of the fence. So I want to know how do I get this lot since it was. So it was a demo and they told you that you had to clear the lien or clear the lot? I had to clear everything. So okay, we need the address for the, the side lot that you're interested in. 2990. Your, your, no, what's your address? What's your home? Mine is 2996. Okay, and, you, and the lot that you're interested in is 2990. Zero. But they be weak, but they claim it was sold to a private owner. Is there a neighbor on the other side of, yes. of you? Mm, okay. But they're renters. Mm, okay, so, and you, sir, we need you to give your information to, no, give this information so that we can contact you. Yes. Yes. Mr. Daniels. Hello, how's everybody doing? Yes. Uh, yes, oh, no, sir. How can we help you? Uh, my name is Jerome Shell, and uh, I'm a senior citizen, and I own some properties throughout Detroit. Uh, I'm also a trade instructor, and I'm a real estate investor, and uh, I'm also the chairman of a committee called Black Lives Have Value, which is all about generational wealth, health, and education. Uh, and I'm also an elected official. I'm a precinct delegate. Yes. But my situation, 
I have had a nightmare with the land bank and with the city of Detroit. I remember you. Um, what I have is, uh, first of all, right now I'm dealing with an issue where the land bank has with, promised me property, but they sold it to another developer right next to my properties in several locations. But my biggest thing is, you know, I own a, um, a group of row houses and there's two on one block and it turns the corner and there's two on the side street. And the one at the end, uh, the land bank broke into that one and uh, they, they, they came in, broke into it. They had a guy in there. He, he, that's where I stored all my equipment at. I remember this. He, he was selling my stuff out of my property property adjacent to it belongs to the land bank. This guy thought that this property that the land bank owned was mine. So he starts shipping the bricks off of that property thinking it was mine. Meanwhile, he's selling everything out of my property and the land, that the land bank broke into with, prop, with pictures, with witnesses, with videotape and interviews from people from the land bank who said that during my time, especially I was in my sick bed and my, my uh, Uber drivers were telling me that people are out in front of my properties in that neighborhood, several of them, people from the land bank with sandwiches and drinks saying that they own my property. Now, keep in mind, I'm in my sick bed at the time. And I was on the phone, and they told me that they were on my property, but they didn't. Also, the land bank put a for sale sign out in front of this property and had it up for sale with pictures. I tried to, even before they broke into there, I tried to explain to a young man at the land bank that the properties didn't belong to them, them they belonged to me. He, was, he laughed it off like I was some conspiracy theorist or something. But eventually, when I told him to just simply to look at the address, the addresses go up in a different direction, he finally called me back and he said, well, I'm gonna change the lock to a combination of your choice. And that was the end of that. And I was never contacted about that. Now, I, I just happened to hear you on a radio show one time and I gave my example of how my nightmare with the land bank, and, 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 you, and I got your number, and, and when I talked to you, you said that, okay, you would look it up, Indeed. and you got back with me, and you saw that I said that the land bank records every conversation, and everything is fact and documented that the land bank broke into my property, and I was promised to be made whole, and I haven't heard anything from that. Now, but here's the reason that I'm here today. I was just in, at city council uh, over a week ago, I got a ticket for my particular property, which is there's the only thing missing is a couple of basement windows and a few bricks. Now, adjacent to it is the land bank's property, which is totally devastated, totally open. And uh, the inspectors in front of the city council would not even talk about the rest of the properties. They were only interested in my properties. The city attorney, asked me to step outside away from the cameras and disrespected me. I was thinking he was gonna give me some advice, but he disrespected me in the hallway, not knowing that I was waiting in line with a couple of police officers to, to explain and show them videotape of other incidents where the city has disrespected my property. Now, when he got me out in the hallway, not understanding that I'm a, first of all, also an elected official, he disrespected me and right there, cause I was off, from what he thought I was off, he was off camera. Not recognizing that there's cameras in the hallway and the police officers also had body cameras on them. So, and, and, and the inspector who would not show the pictures of the land bank property, uh, they giving me tickets. And I mean ticket after ticket. Not just me, but my property also with my other partners. We have over a thousand tickets just for our properties alone. The inspectors have gone to each and every property that we own and just keep on writing tickets. I also have a 13,000 square foot warehouse on Forest, which the city came in and they came in and they, and, they, and they tore down part of my property by mistake and caused a catastrophe. I've, sent, I've since went to get a deferral, I've paid for the deferral, but my problem is because of this administration and them not wanting me to do the same thing that the other contractors, and, and I remind you that we have a lot of properties that we have in the city and that we are also licensed contractors too. And this particular, the other particular property has an open permit on it, but they still had a, a, a team come in and tear down two thirds of my 13,000 square foot warehouse. I've been to city council and every time I go there, all I get is a bunch of run around and no progress at all. 
And the only thing I'm saying is that, and even with the land bank, the one thing that you don't recognize is that when they were talking about the bundles, uh, uh, the, the, the mayor puts in uh, rules with the Wayne County auction, even though he's not the one who runs it. Eric Sabri runs that. But he puts these bundles in there. For example, the last bundle that he put in the Wayne County was called a demolition bundle. And in this property, the opening bid was $300,000. Now, the only rule was if you win that bid, you have to tear down each and every property in that uh, bundle. But as a direct result, as an investor, I'm not going to bid on that property. But what happens with that property if nobody bids on it? It goes to the land bank. But here's where they eliminate up to 70% of your real estate investors, developers, and agents with just one move every year. If, it go, if the property goes back to the land bank, they don't use the same rules. They'll take one property and fix it up and sell it for 300000 because those properties that are on the demo list, just because they're on the list, they're not scheduled for demolition. And that's how they take away from our generation of wealth. So the only thing I want to say is that uh, the folks up top who are making the decisions, they need to use the same criteria that they use for the dominant culture, which is their history. Okay? And that's one of the biggest problems with our people in our city. The people that are making decisions, most of them don't even have the accreditation or certification of our history to make decisions on us in the first place. So, uh, I um, remember your case and I, when I talked to you. I, I had someone I thought reach out to you about potential, I'm sorry, about your potential um, interest in the land bank house next to yours. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if you were interested in it, but I was, if you own the row, I thought maybe there was an opportunity for you to de develop the whole thing. Well, we, we talked about that, but you never got back with me on that. I, I thought somebody had reached out to you. They so um, I'm going to ask you to step out, give them your contact information, and let's talk about um, potentially that de you developing. I know you have all the experience, that whole block of property, so that you won't get tickets for your property, and we can remove all of the blight in that block. OK, I appreciate okay. that. But okay. one other thing. Yes. Uh, there's something that all of you guys should, should consider. Most of the decisions that are made about the people in our community, most of the people that are making them don't have the experience or the certification of our history. So you should think about using the same criteria that you use for every other community, mm -hmm. which is their history, it, especially our children and our students. Our children don't have the same representation in this system as white children, and white children are being misrepresented. That makes both black and white children miseducated. So in order for our children to have the right representation, their history has to be in the books. Because in order for you to teach and in order for you to do anything for anybody else, they use the same criteria that they use as the largest corporations in the world. So use the same criteria for our children, too. That's Absolutely. All. Thank you, sir. Okay. Let me ask my question right quick. Hello, everyone. Hello. My name is Toya Watts. I want to ask y'all one question before I even begin to talk. Do y'all know what year they started tearing homes down in the city of Detroit? Do any of y'all know right here on this panel? What year was it? Y'all ain't did y'all homework? Oh, oh, no, y'all didn't. Y'all couldn't tell me what year they started tearing homes down in the city of Detroit. And now we got all this vacant land in the city of Detroit that we cannot get a piece of the rock and we going through hell to get the rock of wealth built back into our community. So what's the problem downtown? Why is it such a runaround? Why is it a revolving door when it comes to the damn land bank in the city of Detroit? Look at here, in this paper, 1973, my daddy bought these lots next door to me. He paid $250 of his hard-earned gambling money to buy the lot next door to build my mama a garage to put their car in. And now I can't even keep it in my family. I thought my daddy put it all in the tax when he paid the property tax. Now the city of Detroit got it. What the hell going on? This is my wealth right here. And I can't keep this wealth going for my kids. I want this land back in our name. 
I don't want the city to have nothing. My daddy to sweat over to keep. So who going to help me today? Who going to lie to me today? Who going to tell me to call them? I got your number, baby. I even got your email back in 2021. But you never emailed me back. Dwayne, I got you, baby. Don't forget you got them sons. Don't lie to me no more. I want my wealth back. I want it back. I don't want to hear no more hold up why you can't do and what you can't do for me. I want my daddy's land back. He paid for it. $250. You want to see the paperwork? Do you want to see the paperwork today? Okay, look at it. Here it is. Come get it. Come get it. My daddy sweated. Back in 1969, he bought it in 1973. And I want it back. Is it one? How many lots is it? One lot. And they're going to tell me I got to tear the garage down to get it back. That's bull. I don't want to hear that. Okay? Thank you. You all, the meeting is concluding. We are going to exit out into breakout rooms. The meeting is concluding. We will be going into breakout rooms.